In the next section, we're going to talk about naming the substituents groups, the branches that are connected to the parent chain. Now, many substituent groups are quite simple. They're just carbon chains themselves. There are also halogens, which are treated as substituents, and ethers, which are also treated as substituents. Carbon group substituents are called alkyl groups. If we look at the Lewis structure of an alkyl group, what we see is that the carbon that is uh, attached to the parent chain would have a complete octet, but it would have essentially an empty bond that could be used to attach to the parent chain. So that would be sort of where we would attach. So for example, meth as a carbon group would be called meth il, and we would see that it would have three hydrogens and then one bond that would be available to attach to something else. Two carbon group is called ethyl, and on this second carbon, it has a bond to the first carbon, it has two hydrogens, and then it has an empty bond. There's even carbon groups that have more than one group at place to attach. So for example, CH2 can attach on one bond and on a second bond, and that's called methylene. Okay, so how do we name these? Well, to name simple, unbranched carbon groups, no unsaturations. We name them by dropping the A from the end of the parent and then adding YL instead. So for example, this is a four carbon um, substituent group. The parent would be buta. We cross out the A or drop the A and we put YL. So this is butyl instead. Now, when we're putting substituent names onto uh, a molecule, what we do is we list the substituent names in alphabetical order in front of the parent name. And we have to put a locant number and a dash to indicate where the substituent is attached. Remember that any time we change from letters to numbers, we have to put a dash. So, um, we should always have a dash between a letter and number, and we don't put spaces between the substituents and the parent chain name. So look at this example. Got a lot of stuff going on here, okay? Basically, this would be our parent chain. So the first thing we would have to do is find the longest carbon chain, which is turns out to be this horizontal chain of nine carbons. We would then check the two numbering systems. And what we would find is that in the red numbering system, we would have substituents at 4 and 8. In the green numbering system, they would be at 2 and 6. So comparing those, the first number is the first locant that's different. 2 is lower than 4. So therefore, we're going to use the green numbering system. <clears throat> With that in place then, the substituents would be 2-methyl, because it has one carbon, and 6-ethyl, because that substituent has two carbons. We would then look at the first letter of those substituent names, not counting mono, di, tri, whatever those prefixes are. In that case, E is lower alphabetically than M, so we're going to put the ethyl substituent first in the name. Notice that that's even though the number is higher. So it's the alphabetical that is important. So to build this name then, we have a nine carbon chain, which would be Nona. We drop the A, there's no um, unsaturation, so we use A-N-E for our ending and we have no functional groups. So it would be nonane, and then attached to that nonane chain would be an ethyl at carbon six and a methyl at carbon two. So six ethyl dash two dash methyl 
no name. Notice the dash between ethyl and the two locant number for the methyl. Now halogens are not treated as functional groups in IUPAC naming. Instead, we just treat them as substituents. So here are the halogens and their substituent names. So fluorine becomes fluoro, chlorine becomes chloro, bromine becomes bromo, iodine becomes iodo. So notice they just all end in O. Similarly, ethers are not treated as functional groups. Instead, they're treated as substituents. To name an ether substituent, what we do is we find the oxygen, we find the two attached groups, we determine which one is the parent chain, then the alkyl group that is not the parent chain will become the basis for the naming of that ether substituent. What we then do is we start with the alkyl group name, meth, we drop the YL and we replace it with oxy. So methyl becomes meth oxy. So here are a couple of examples. The first example is just naming a basic ether. You can see that in this ether, here's the oxygen. We have a five carbon chain and we have a one carbon chain. So the five carbon chain would be the parent. Since it's five carbons, then it's a pentane. And we would number it to put the ether substituent, which is the only substituent, at the lowest number. So we would use this red numbering system where the ether would be at two. Then the ether has a methyl, but because it's attached to an oxygen, we drop the YL and we replace it with oxy. So this overall then would be two methoxy. So the methoxy group is attached on carbon two of a pentane. Here's an example where I have a methyl group and a chloryl group. <clears throat> In that case then, we have two substituents. So we have to determine which numbering system is going to be correct. So if we look at the numbering system, the red numbering system has the methyl at carbon two and the chlorine at carbon five, so two and five. The green numbering system has the chlorine at number three and the methyl at carbon six, so three and six. So in this case, we are not going to give a special priority to the chlorine. Chlorine has no special priority. The alkoxy groups of ethers have no special priority. What's important is the first locant that's different having the lowest number. In this case, then, the red numbering system where the first locant is, that's different is two versus the green where it's three would have priority. So the methyl would end up with the lowest number. In that case, then, we just lift the, list these in front. Again, methyl starts with M, chloro starts with C. So alphabetically, the chloro will be listed first, but it will have its proper number determined by the numbering rules. So we would have 5-chloro-2 methyl, and then the overall chain has 7, so heptane. Again, this is trying to show that halogen substituents and alkoxy substituents do not have a special priority. We just use the numbering rules and treat them all equally. When two or more substituents are identical, we're going to group them together and use the prefixes di, tri, or tetra in front of the names. However, every substituent has to have its number listed even when the numbers are the same. So for example here, 2, 2, 3, trimethyl. We have three methyls, we need three numbers even though two of the numbers are the same at two. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So in this case, I have a long carbon chain. Do you see that? It's got nine carbons in it. So it's gonna be a known, there's no double bonds, no name. Now, we do a numbering system on top in red, a numbering system on the bottom in blue, and we just list the numbers. So the red one has a substituent at two, 
at 3 and at 6. Doesn't matter what the substituents are. The green one has a substituent at 4, at 7, and at 8. So we list the numbers, we find the first one that's different, which would be the very first one, and between those two, 2 is lower than 4. So we would choose the red numbering system. Looking at our substituents then, we have at carbon 2, a methyl. At carbon 3, a methyl. At carbon 5, an ethyl. Okay, so what we're going to do, I'm sorry, carbon 6. At carbon 6, an ethyl. What we're going to do is we're going to put these two methyl groups together in the name. So two methyls would be dimethyl. And what we need to do is list their numbers in front. So what we have, instead of a 2-methyl, 3-methyl, we have 2,3-dimethyl. I often use the analogy of algebra when we collect terms. So for example, if I have x plus x, in other words, 2-methyl plus 3-methyl, what I can do is I can collect those together and say I have 2x's. In other words, di x. So same thing here, I have 2-methyl, and 3-methyl, I can say I have 2 and 3 dimethyl. Now, the interesting thing is that the di, the D, is going to be ignored for alphabetical order. So we're going to alphabetize this as an M. And the ethyl will be alphabetized as E. So it will come first. So 6-ethyl, and then 2-3-dimethyl, and then our parent chain name. The complication in our systematic number naming system is that sometimes the branches themselves have branches. In other words, substituents can be branched. That makes naming them a lot more complicated. This is a rule that it appears the IUPAC has changed recently, but that hasn't quite reached the textbooks and the standardized exams yet. So be aware that we may have another situation where there's old, old names and new names. There are also common names for some of these branches, which we're going to look at later. And the IUPAC has basically given up on trying to force everyone to use systematic and accepts the common names. So in fact, common names generally are preferred when they are available. So you can see that it's sort of a mess. but. What we're going to do is we're going to kind of break it down so that we can understand what's going on and be able to deal with systematic branch names. Okay, so what do we do? Well, what we see is that branches are attached to parent chains. So we have a parent chain. We're ignoring what the parent chain is. We just know that there is a branch which looks like this attached somewhere to that parent chain. Now, if we look at the branch then, there will be one atom, most often a carbon, but not necessarily, one atom that is directly attached to the parent chain. We are going to call that atom the point of attachment. What we're going to do is start with the point of attachment, and we are going to find the longest carbon chain starting from the point of attachment. Sometimes that will mean that there is potentially a different longer carbon chain. But we still have to always start from the point of attachment. So in this example here, you can see we have a carbon chain of three carbons starting from here going to there and to there. Furthermore, we're going to number that longest parent carbon chain of our, sorry, that longest carbon chain of our complex substituent. When we number it, we are always going to number it starting from the point of attachment. So again, this point of attachment will be 1, and we will go 2 and 3. Okay, at that point then, we can name that main chain of our branch, right? It's a 3-carbon chain, it's an alkyl group, so it is propyl. We also have a numbering system. 
what we now have is we have a second branch attached to our main branch. And it is attached on carbon 2. And it is a methyl. So we have a methyl on carbon 2 of our branch. So what we're going to do is we're going to put that substituent name in front of the main name of our branch. So this is going to become a 2-methyl propyl substituent. That would then be attached to a parent chain. So we put that name in front of the parent chain. And in fact, we're going to see that we're going to have to use parentheses to show that the whole thing is attached. And we're going to have to put a number also in many cases. So again, I want to point out that in complex substituent, we always start the parent chain and start the numbering at the carbon directly attached to the parent chain. In other words, at the point of attachment. So in this case, if you look, if I had started here, I could have a five carbon chain. But this carbon that I've circled, the methyl group, is not directly attached to the parent. So instead, we're going to start next to it. And that's going to give us, as our longest chain for our substituent, a four carbon chain. So we will call it a butyl. And then we will indicate that we have a methyl attached on carbon one of that substituent. Now, one of the problems here, and I've got a lot of writing on this, okay? But one of the problems that we have is that sometimes people get confused and they don't know which carbon to call the point of attachment. And in fact, they often mistakenly include carbons from the parent chain into the substituent. All right, so let's look at this molecule. So what I have is this long chain that I've circled connected to this complicated substituent. Now, if you look, the long chain that I've circled has a carbon that has a bond connecting to the substituent. Okay, now the longest carbon chain that I've circled, that's going to be the parent chain of our molecule. We're going to number that. Now, I sort of cheated here and I put the substituent in the exact middle so it doesn't matter which direction we number from, it's at carbon 5. So we have something attached here at carbon 5 of the parent. Now, that carbon then, carbon 5 that I've circled, is not part of the substituent. It is not the point of attachment. That is a carbon in the parent chain. It counts as part of these nine. So we don't want to count it also as part of this branch. Okay, now let's look at our substituent. So this is the point of attachment of our substituent. We're going to start counting there. And we can see that we go one, two, three, that's the main chain of the substituent. So it's a three carbon chain, so we're going to call it a probe and add the ending. Then we're going to number starting from the point of attachment that we circled here, one, two, three, and we're going to have attached to carbon one, a methyl group. So the name of this substituent is 1-methylpropyl. Now to put this into the name then, what we have to show is that this entire thing is attached at far carbon 5 of our parent. To do that then, what we do is we take this entire name and we put it in parentheses. That way we know that this entire name refers to a substituent, not to, for example, having a methyl attached on the main chain and then also a propyl and whatever. Okay, So we put that in parentheses. Then what we do is we put a number with a dash in front of that parentheses, indicating that at carbon 5 of our parent, we have this complex substituent attached. It looks a little confusing, but once you do a few and break it down, you will see that it makes sense. We're building the names out of pieces. We just want to make sure we keep the pieces all together.